Hello and welcome. Britain may have condemned the violent attacks on Libya's protesters in the past few days, but does it have blood on its hands for selling weapons to Libya in the first place? The infamous 2004 deal in the desert handshake between former British Prime Minister Tony Blair and Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi was not only an attempt to welcome the North African colonel into the international community, but more importantly for Britain, paved the way for lucrative business between the two countries. The deal saw the Anglo-Dutch oil company Shell sign an exploration agreement with Libya worth up to $1 billion. Three years later, oil giant British Petroleum signed a $900 million offshore oil exploration deal with Colonel Gaddafi. British arms companies have also profited. In the third quarter of 2010 alone, according to the Campaign Against Arms Trade, the UK licensed over $6 million worth of ammunition to Libya, including sniper rifles and crowd control ammunition, which is suspected of being used against protesters in the current uprising. On Monday, the British government cancelled eight arms exports licenses for Libya. So today we ask, how guilty is the West of double standards when it comes to dealing with Arab regimes? Remember, you can join our conversation with your questions and comments by sending an SMS or an email. Well, joining me in Washington, D.C. is Ibrahim Saad, Secretary General of the anti gaddafi Group, the National Front for the Salvation of Libya. Mr. Saad was Libya's representative to the United Nations in the 1970s. In London, I'm joined by Sir Richard Dalton, a former British ambassador to Libya. He's also an associate fellow on the Middle East and North African program at the International Affairs Organization, Chatham House. Also in D.C. is Hafid al Ghuel, a Libyan-American analyst based in D.C. who's a leading critic of the Gaddafi government. I welcome you all to the show. Uh, and uh, Hafid al Ghuel, I'll start with you, sir. I just, yeah, Muammar Gaddafi has been seen on Libyan TV, state TV, with a tough message, uh, essentially threatening the protesters. Uh, and he said he's willing to martyr for his country, you know, be a martyr for his country, and he's not intending to leave. How do you think that's going to resonate with the people in Libya right now? I, I, I think the same way that uh, his son's speech uh, resonated a couple of days ago. This is a, a clear threat uh, by a dictator. Um, I think that his, his statement was very clearly coming from a deranged, afraid dictator who's trying to project an image of strength and control. Um, I think everybody sees through that. And it is, uh, in some ways, I think it is good for, for, for the Libyan, uh, uh, for, for the international community to see the kind of personality that the Libyan people have been dealing with for the last 42 years and, and, and the craziness and, uh, and the thuggery of, of the system that they are under. You have family there. What, what, uh, what are they telling you about what's going on? I have uh, my entire family there. Uh, many Libyans have uh, their entire families there. And, and they are, uh, uh, you have different reports coming from different uh, family members. Uh, are they scared? They are confused. They don't know what's going on. Um, they are all uh, uh, have sympathy for the pro-democracy protesters. They all are trying to do their bit as much as they can. Uh, so th th there is a, 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 a the one thing that is very clear, despite 42 years of Gaddafi trying to fragment the Libyan society mm -hmm. and turn it against each other through tribal and um, uh, and, and 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 other uh, ways. Uh, today, the entire population stands united against him and demanding one thing for him to step down. Well, Mr. Ibrahim Saad, I want to welcome you, in, sir, and, and I know that you've been very critical of the international community not playing a more active part. What what should be done right now then? Well, I think it's very late uh, for the uh, international community. Uh, but I would like to see the uh, Security Council convene very quickly and take a, a resolution which swiftly allow uh, the international community to uh, help protecting the civilian inside Libya. Uh, the whole population of uh, the Libyans facing a brutal regime using all kind of uh, weapons against uh, its own people using even mercenaries and that's crime against humanity that's crimes of war uh, that's go to uh, to to annihilating the whole uh, population to stay in power and i think the international community is committing a big mistake by not acting uh, very soon to this uh, to this brutal regime it's a massacre mm -hmm. and it's a genocide well on the show we're going to look at the relationship the international community has with uh, with libya and i'll get into that in a moment but i want to welcome in sir richard dalton glad you could join us sir and i, I know you believe it's going to take a long time to resolve this particular conflict don't you uh, why is that well first i have to say that your allegation that Britain has blood on its hands is totally false. There's no question of Britain having blood on its hands, uh, no more than any other country outside Libya might have blood on its hands in respect to the deaths in Egypt or in Tunisia. 
Uh, yes, this may take time to settle, and I think the international community, starting with the Security Council today, has got to deliver much clearer messages. Uh, first, that the Libyan authorities will be held accountable for what they do to their people. I don't believe you can substantiate an allegation of genocide. You can certainly substantiate an allegation of grossly excessive use of force. But I think also the message has to be that the international community expects there to be a political channel to deal with these issues. Uh, clearly, the opposition, which has every right to demonstrate and every right to make its views clear, has got to get together and organize so that there is a clear channel either for the international community to deal with uh, or for any successor authority in Libya. At the moment, we see a chaotic mm -hmm. situation. There are obligations both on the regime uh, and on the people who want to see a better life okay. for the people of Libya. Well, Sir Richard, yeah, I, I should point out, by the way, it's not an allegation that Britain does have blood on its hands. It's just merely a question to get the debate going. And but I appreciate your comment. I want, to do, I want to put an email question to you, if I may, sir, that came in from Ethiopia from a viewer by the name of Ghuled uh, Kasawe in Jijiga, who wrote in saying, Western nations have shown great disrespect for the democratic values that people in the Middle East are struggling to achieve. I'm skeptical of the Europeans' delayed response to Mubarak's deadly crackdown and their quick criticism of Muammar Gaddafi. I mean, I wonder what, to, in your, in, from your perspective, to what degree has there been a lack of consistency in the way the international community has dealt with the various uprisings that have been taking place in this sort of domino effect throughout the Middle East? I think if you look at every single document about policy towards the region for many years now, uh, you will find it quite clear that we expected the rulers to improve the human rights performance, to improve their performance under civil and political rights too. Uh, obviously, there are major interests at play here, and it is not an immoral thing for countries to act in accordance with their interests. For example, in dealing with Libya on the matter of oil, uh, given the need for European energy security to keep our industries going. Uh, it's absolutely plain that in our dealings with Libya, we expressed our dissatisfaction uh, with the many aspects of the way in which Libya was conducting its affairs. And I think the long history uh, of the improvement in, in Libya's relations with the international community, based on uh, work against terrorism, uh, work to eliminate weapons of mass destruction, work on development in Africa. It hasn't gone perfectly, but it has been a substantial improvement on the way Libya was behaving in the 70s and 80s, both for the interests of the Libyan people and for the interests of the okay. region. And those positive aspects shouldn't be neglected. All right, so I'll get back to you just a moment. Let me bring in uh, Hafid al Ghuel again here. And just and I just ask what you expect to happen now. I mean, further confrontation, is that is that likely scenario? And, and how real are the fears that uh, uh, Muammar Gaddafi's threat to, to sort of kill as many people as need be is, is going to be enacted? If I may, just for a second, I, I find it really quite disrespectful for, for people in the West to tell us that what they have done with Gaddafi over the last few years is in the benefit of the Libyan people. It is nonsense. I mean, this is uh, 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 Britain, the United States, and others uh, uh, are exactly uh, uh, doing. The, it's the same example as giving a gun to a deranged lunatic who's holding his family hostage in a house. And then when he shoots them, they all stand out and say, well, we are not responsible for it. But anyway, for, for your own point, um, I think it is dangerous. And I think the, region, the reason why it is dangerous uh, is because uh, the international community is allowing this this guy to continue to push the, the situation to a catastrophic end. And I, and I think that's where the urgency of trying to contain him uh, in some way uh, is, is really the critical factor here in whether this country will, will slide towards chaos or whether we will have uh, uh, some form of, of a peaceful transition uh, and, and, and a protection of, of, of the lives of, of the Libyans. So th 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 these are fluid situations, but if you allow this man to, to start killing his own people this way while watching him on television, while he is trying to justify it uh, in the guise of uh, Tiananmen Square scenario or, 
or, or the Russian Revolution uh, scenarios, as he said in his speech. Uh, we are looking at, at a really serious situation. On the, on the issue you raised, I want to get to, to Mr. Ibrahim Sahad the question that came in from a viewer in Canada, if I may, please, sir. This came in from Sumaya Virji, who, who wrote in from Quebec, saying, the arms agreement several years ago between Blair and Gaddafi implies that British weaponry is being used against the Libyan people. Cameron's public condemnation of these violent attacks is an attempt to quash any accusations of British complicity. And, and I know that uh, Monarish uh, Maui, the legal advisor to the UN High Commission on Human Rights, has said there's now a real question mark over arms sales uh, to the Libyan regime, saying that you know if these weapons were used were British weapons uh, that killed more than 300 people, there may be a backlash now. And I wonder what sort of backlash you might think there, there might be. Well, first of all, we all agree that uh, any country would seek its own interests. But if I, uh, if I understood uh, Sir Richard about his implication, I'm afraid that, uh, to say that the interest of, the, of the Britain and, and the West go uh, against the interest of the Libyan people by having uh, dignified life, by have, uh, living under uh, human rights uh, respect, by living in democracy, by getting rid of, of, of a tyrant like Gaddafi. I mean, this is very important, and uh, I think in the long run that will affect the relation between Libya and other uh, countries, between the Libyan people, how Libyan people look to the, to the West. I'd like to just to mention that Libyan, Libyans went into alliance with the British during World War II, and we have a very good relation with, with Britain. But when we see uh, weapons, British weapons uh, used by Gaddafi against our own people, when you see uh, uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair hugging Gaddafi, uh, a, a, a murderer, a certified terrorist, then this is this is should be should be, should be uh, uh, put under uh, under uh, under uh, investigation. I want to give Sir Richard a chance to answer some of the comments that uh, we've made here in the studio in D.C. Uh, Sir Richard, also a question, if I may, as you answer that, to to that came in from a viewer from California, from the USA, Sima Obaid wrote in saying. Human rights abuses are the first concern of Western nations when they're domestic. However, when there are abuses in the Middle East and North Africa region, the West cares only for their self-interests. And I wonder, you know, if, if the, the West has preached that there should be democratic rule, or you know, and that's been a message often used as a pretext to, to take military action in parts of the world, I wonder why that, you know, these long-standing regimes uh, such as Egypt and, and uh, Tunisia and uh, Libya have been, have been tolerated so long, sir. Well, I believe many of the people who've spoken wouldn't wish there to be wholesale uh, re-establishment of the colonial order in which foreigners make and unmake governments. Uh, I haven't heard a single practical suggestion from your other two guests as to how we, or anybody else, should bring about the end of the Qadhafi regime. I made a practical proposal, which is to send a strong political message through the Security Council that Colonel Qadhafi will be held accountable, and his regime will be held accountable. And perhaps the other speakers could suggest what should be done rather than bewailing the situation. Obviously, we are at one, all three of us, okay. in thinking that what has happened is <coughs> appalling. L let me get that response from uh, half I, of the I'll word. be happy to tell you what sh uh, both what should have happened and what should happen moving forward, sir. Uh, first, wh what should have happened is that you do not uh, support a deranged lunatic like Gaddafi just simply by uh, 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 because he accepted to hand over a, a bunch of scrap metal and you uh, 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 pretend that it was a nuclear program. The fact that uh, you should not have supported him because he was trying to vow to, 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 to support your anti-terrorism movement, wh which basically meant that he, he, uh, uh, he abused the, the rights of, of Libyan people. That's what should have happened. Moving forward, what should have happened, what should happen now, yes. But uh, statements and declarations are, 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 are a dime a dozen. Uh, there has to be an action done by the United Nations uh, in which you, you, you at least try to protect the population of the country uh, uh, from this onslaught. I mean, Egypt lost about 300 people in 18, 19 days. Libya is now, a Human Rights Watch is reporting 500 or so dead. But after the, let me ask you, what would have been, when you said, you know, this is the, the, the UK and other countries shouldn't have supported uh, Muammar Gaddafi at this time with, you know, for all this time, what would have been the alternative? What would have been the action that could have been taken? I, they should have, uh, I'm not against opening up to Libya. The question is how you do it. They could have put on the table in negotiations with him 
in addition to the nuclear issue, in addition to the terrorism issue, they should have put the reform and governance and human rights on the table. This nonsensical statements coming out of the White House or the State Department or everywhere telling us that somehow they were raising these issues of human rights in private is, is insult added to injury. Why, why is it difficult to raise the issue of human rights publicly like they raise the issue of, of, of terrorism publicly, like uh, sending him uh, through the rendition program people he can torture? I mean, it's obscene. And, and what we have seen, uh, sorry, Riz, but what we have seen coming out is the kind of deal that, 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 uh, that uh, 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 England and uh, particularly the UK government has, has struck with Gaddafi in secret, in the ba in, in, in back rooms. I mean, all of this public statements is nonsensical. Mm -hmm. and Mr. Saad, interestingly, the U.S. actually has been critical of the U.K., saying that it propped up Muammar Gaddafi. And I wonder, is there some kind of friction you see between uh, America and Britain now because of this? Well, I, I think they, uh, th there will be no friction because they, uh, they will just talk uh, publicly and then the deals on, on and behind the scenes will be different. Uh, now we, we, we are facing our disappointment with the reaction of international communities and uh, the call for the Security Council to convene after seven days of massacre, brutal massacre, is something which I, I, I think uh, I should condemn. It should be done the first uh, two days, it should be done earlier than that and now talking about this kind of declaration which we hear from London and, and Washington uh, we didn't hear much from Washington by, by any way, but uh, this kind of declaration does not give any protection to the Libyan people. The Libyan people are under the machinery of the certified terrorist. This terrorist, who declared as a, 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 as a terrorist internationally, was dealing with as terrorist fighter, as an alliance in terrorist fighting. Mm -hmm. This is an unbelievable. And this is uh, a matter of, of, of concern for us to see Libyan people killed every, every day and nothing has been done in Syria. So Richard, you'd mentioned earlier the, the issue of uh, you know, the security of Britain and other European countries which are heavily dependent on Libyan oil. Uh, you know, the, the, the chaos that's ensuing now might, might ha pose some kind of energy security risk. What do you see this as far as the scenario there? What's going to happen? I'm sorry, I have to ask you to let me have the opportunity Please. to rebut the repeated allegations that are made against Britain. First, there is no evidence whatsoever of British arms being used. Uh, secondly, I can understand the, the misery that people feel at the, at the murders taking place in Libya, but we still haven't heard a practical suggestion about how this protection uh, can be offered. Uh, thirdly, I would ask, is the world or is it not a better place as a result of the negotiated improvements in Libya's international behavior uh, that have been achieved in the matter of terrorism and in the matter of weapons of mass destruction. And I reject utterly the suggestion that all that was handed over in 2003 was a bunch of scrap metal. And I would refer the speaker to the International Atomic Energy Agency's repeated reports about the degree to which that program was advanced and the degree to which the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was protected by virtue of the negotiated end of that program. Obviously, there is a long way to go on the question of human rights. And I appreciate and can sympathize with the fact that that wasn't the highest possible priority. And all I can say is that countries are mandated by their populations to achieve a balance in their international relations. And that means when you're dealing with Russia, you try and achieve the best possible world that you can by dealing with Russia. And maybe you soft pedal what happens in Chechnya. You don't give the maximum priority at the exclusion of everything else of what happens in Chechnya. The other point I need to make is that there is no genuine friction between the United States and the United Kingdom on this question because Ambassador Sussman got it wrong. The United States oil firms are even more active in Libya than the UK ones. There are no new arms sales to Libya, but American arms firms are in there too. Uh, so if what he was saying was a criticism, it was undoubtedly a criticism of the United States government. And we've noticed absolutely nothing more from Washington on this subject. The fact is, the United Kingdom is not ahead of the pack in its relations with Libya. We got in late, long after the Italians and long after the French. 
because it took us time to deal with our serious bilateral issues with Libya, both on the matter of Lockerbie and the killing mm -hmm. of WPC Fletcher. Uh, after the, uh, uh, let me ask you then, A, in response, of course, you know, the, the ambassador I mean, has made some <coughs> interesting points there. Uh, let me ask you how you regard this, this uh, view of um, the U.S.-British uh, dynamic, and many saying that uh, it was a way for the U.S. The U.S. warmed up to the idea that there was a Bush Blair axis that, that helped to show that the invasion of Saddam Hussein's, uh, of Iraq under Saddam Hussein, was a valid movement because it encouraged Muammar Gaddafi to give up his. I, I, I have no doubt. I mean, knowing, uh, I, I don't know the, the background of this, but I could assure you that at least Washington had very little really uh, motivated people when it comes to Libya. I mean, it was a, a very minor issue on the agenda of most of the United States policymakers, and they were taking their, 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 their uh, uh, hints from, from London, and the lead was definitely from England. It was not here. Um, and, and that is based on my own personal contacts with a number of these policies. They warmed up to the idea as they're moving forward, and they were desperate during an election to show some form of, of, of a, a win after what happened in Iraq. But, but, but the question is also that, I mean, I think it's clear now from a lot of the leaked documents uh, on WikiLeaks and others, uh, uh, really what, what was uh, happening behind the scene when it came to, to Libya among British policymakers. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's a very clear um, issue. Now, of course, Mr. Saad, uh, Mr. Saad, there's the issue of what happens next in terms of uh, who would run Libya if uh, the Gaddafi regime falls and what kind of relationship it, it would then have with Europe and with the U.S. Well, at the moment in the cities where the demonstrators uh, running, uh, they uh, already constituted uh, committees to run the, those cities and uh, I got uh, reports from Benghazi and other cities that there was an atmosphere of uh, solidarity and uh, friendship, uh, brotherhood, which uh, did not exist under Gaddafi regime and under his, his, his tyranny. Uh, I think these committees will run the country until we uh, formulate a, a government which take a transitional period uh, so for some time to draw a an, an constitution and to put this constitution for referendum in front of the Libyan people. After that, what uh, this constitution stipulate will be uh, the new Libya. Uh, we're looking for uh, democratic Libya. We're looking for Libya with multiple parties. We're looking for Libya, which has a very good relations with its neighbors, with the Arab world, with the international community, especially with the, our allies in the past. It's not going to be easy, though, Mr. F uh, Mr. Saad, uh, is it, with a country that's been for more than four decades centered around one man and his family? It, it would be very difficult. It's not easy, especially with, with the way Gaddafi ran the country. But I am sure that uh, when we have uh, our freedom back, uh, Libyans started uh, their independence, started their state in 1951 from scratch. They could do the same. L Libyan gathered to uh, formulate a constitution in 1951, and at that time it, it was different than now, the, the, the education, and now it's easier to, to sit together and to draw a constitution. Uh, I think it, it just Gaddafi should go and we got rid of, of Gaddafi regime, it will be easier for the Libyan people to get together, to formulate uh, their, uh, their, their constitution, and to follow suit. This is, this is very, very, very important, and I don't, I'm not with, with, with those who put obstacles in, in front of that and saying that there will be a chaos. This is a chaos. Yeah. What is under, under Gaddafi Libya is a chaos. Okay. So, I mean, uh, there will be n nothing but better. All right. Well, Sir Richard, about a minute to go, and I, I ask you, sir, with, with cons you know, irrespective of the facts and figures, obviously there has been a cloud over much of the history uh, with, with Libya, including its relationship with Britain. I wonder, is this a chance to start again from scratch to, to build a relationship with a country that may have a totally new uh, regime? Well, obviously it is, and that's true for absolutely everybody. It was Condoleezza Rice who went to Washington, went, went to Tripoli, of course, to sign the American deals with uh, the Libyans, uh, and uh, all kinds of European heads of state have been to Tripoli, uh, uh, of course, co continuously since 1999. Right. And uh, regrettable, though this seems, to people who are died in the wool opponents of the, the, the Qadhafi regime. I'm afraid it has happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, as with Egypt, as with Tunisia, uh, new relationships have to be built, and okay. I hope on a sounder footing. But uh, frankly, the situation in the short term is what we should all be looking at. 
I mean, if there is a prolonged period of fighting, and there's no doubt that some of the protesters and demonstrators are now armed, uh, what is to become of the mainstay of the employment of 70% of the Libyan people, uh, the income which fuels their families, right. uh, and that is government salaries? Well, so, so I'm deeply worried about the kind of emergency that might arise, particularly in Benghazi, and I think it's up to the international community with the encouragement of Libyan forces outside uh, Libya, like those right. that we're hearing from tonight, to put in place an emergency plan. Well, Sir Richard, I have to stop you there. I have to thank you, gentlemen. We're out of time, but I thank you very much. I know we'll get a chance to talk about this again. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Remember, you can follow the show on Facebook and see what we're up to there. You can give us your feedback on the topics and post your questions and comments. On the next show, is the pen mightier than the sword? We look at the power of literature to inspire revolutions and ask what role do artists and intellectuals play on the front line of popular uprisings? Be sure to tune in for that. For me and the team, we'll see you next time.